The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile, revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you. You may be seated. <laughs> A poem to start. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, she cries, with silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. The poem, which you probably realize by now, is called The New Colossus, and it was written in 1883 by an American poet named Emma Lazarus. It stands adorned on the Statue of Liberty, that testament to American hope, freedom, and promise that all immigrants and refugees pass on their way to these shores. The next two about foreigners are from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and have been echoing in my head this week. As I hear stories about the actions of our country choosing to take against men and women and children fleeing violence and war that is tearing their communities apart. I hear these words when talk rises up of walls and sanctuary cities and deportation. And then Jesus, a student of his time who too has powerful words for how we are to live in this world. But first, some context. Three Sundays ago, Jesus appeared at the Jordan River to be baptized by John, his first public appearance as an adult. Immediately after being baptized, Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. And then last week, we heard the calling of the first disciples. Well, actually, the past two weeks, first from John and then from Matthew, but disciples who dropped everything and followed him. So today we start hearing what being a disciple will look like. For some reason, though, our lectionary decides to skip over two verses between last week's and this week's text. So here they are, from the end of chapter 4. So Jesus' fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought, him, brought to him all who were sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. This is the start of the ministry of the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who saves us from our sin, surrounded by the sick, the diseased, the outcast, and the foreigner. And this Sermon on the Mount, which begins here with the Beatitudes, 
at the start of chapter 5 and extends all the way to the end of chapter 7. For Matthew, this sermon holds a central place in the life of Jesus and shapes what his ministry will look like. Jesus begins his public ministry here with a claim about who his disciples are. Blessed. Those who follow Jesus, 2,000 years ago and today in our own time, you and me, sitting here, Jesus' Jesus's claim on you in your life is that you are blessed. Jesus claims you and your life. Jesus claims who you are and who you belong to, and it is irrevocable. You belong to God. You belong to Christ. You are blessed. But there's something at stake here in these blessings. The call to discipleship is not an idle thing. For too long, and in too many places, we have treated Christianity and discipleship as a passive thing. We've taught many Christians that being a follower of Jesus is simply about going to church on Sunday and living a moral life. We hold strongly to the belief that the church shouldn't engage in politics, as if our church and our life of faith can somehow be separate from our personal life. Now there is some truth here, right? The church should not and cannot be partisan. The church should not and cannot advocate for or against one politician or one party. The church cannot support a particular candidate over another, not because it's illegal, which maybe it is, but because we all come from different places. But that doesn't mean that together we don't engage the world. At the same time that Jesus calls us blessed, he does so by showing us what discipleship looks like, what being a disciple in this world is really like. Meekness, righteousness, merciful, loving, gentle, and kind, peacemaking. Jesus understands that the life of the disciple, both, follow, both following him physically until his death and following him in the ages to come, will not be easy. You're blessed, and you're called to live a certain way in the world. And too often it comes at a cost. There will be difficult times. You may be persecuted. You may be reviled. You may have awful things said about you. That's what happens when you stand among the sick, the suffering, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, and the foreigner. That's what happens when you advocate on behalf of refugees. That's what happens when you rail against policies of isolation. It's what happens when you stand up against bigotry and fear. It's what happens when you call systems of power to repentance. So you've probably guessed at my political leanings, and in fact, some of you have maybe said, a little less politics. And that's okay. But let me be very clear about my politics. I am a follower of Jesus, who believes that Christians have a responsibility to call systems of power towards repentance. I believe the church has a moral, ethical, and a spiritual obligation to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ, loving those who God loves and seeking to live as Jesus lived. I believe that where there is abuse of power, injustice, hoarding of wealth, disproportionate access to health care, hunger, poverty, and victims of violence fleeing the machines of death, the church must raise her voice and call us again towards repentance and action, and I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican, a liberal or a conservative in power. As those Jesus calls blessed, we are to be that blessing to others. That's what the life of discipleship looks like. Notice Jesus says nothing here about salvation. Jesus says nothing here about getting to heaven. And Jesus says nothing here about choirs of angels or streets of gold. For Jesus, the salvation of the blessed, the salvation of the world, is already a given. God is at, already at work redeeming all of creation. God has already claimed you as God's own. You are saved. Sin, death have no power over you. You will still sin. You will still slide. You will still question your faith in God, and maybe even God's faith in you. That's a normal part of this life of faith. But you can rest confident that God, through Jesus Christ, never forsakes you, 
never leaves you, never lets you drown in sin and brokenness. You are blessed. And as the blessed, you are free to live as Christ calls us to live. Starting right here in the Beatitudes. Be meek. Seek righteousness. Be merciful. Be kind and welcoming. Be peacemakers. Hold your leaders accountable to their actions. Hold the church accountable to who Christ calls her to be. You are blessed. Amen.